Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the nation's rice industry was slammed Wednesday by a consumer group for the amount of naturally occur occurring arsenic it contains. Mississippi 4-H'ers teach Holly Springs area community leaders about the advantages of using social media to better communicate with target audiences. In Southern Gardening, crepe myrtles, they're one of the South's favorite flowering trees and they come in several colors you may not be aware of. In the markets, corn prices may be on a downtrend. It has been a roller coaster week. And a new cattle on feed report is out. John Michael Riley has analysis. In the feature segment, agricultural supporters spend a lot of time trying to influence public opinion. Three brothers in Kansas made a YouTube video on their farm and it's collected more than 7 million views so far. Oh, hey, it's a stupid song again. And I'm like, I'm going to change the words, make my friends laugh. And so, uh, Changed the words and my friends thought it was funny. And so I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe I'll make a music video out of that. Good day, everyone. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. The nation's rice industry came into the media spotlight about midweek, but certainly not in the fashion most businesses would like. Leighton, Consumer Reports magazine released the results of its test of naturally occurring arsenic in rice. Now, September is National Rice Month, and the release was handled with an eye toward getting the maximum media attention, which it received. Now, Consumer Reports said that it tested more than 200 samples of nearly 60 kinds of rice products. Nearly all of them contain some of the inorganic form of arsenic. Now, it was found in both organic and conventionally grown rice. It recommended that consumers, particularly children, cut back on their consumption of rice. Consumer Reports called on the federal government to set a level for arsenic levels in rice. Now, the Food and Drug Administration said that it's studying arsenic in rice and it's working towards setting a maximum level for it, perhaps making a proposal next year. The FDA did not, however, advise a change in rice eating habits. Arsenic is a naturally occurring element in soil and water. It's found in virtually all plants. Inorganic arsenic has been found at higher levels, and at those levels it can cause bladder, lung, and skin cancers. Now, the USA Rice Federation says it's unaware of any arsenic-related illness due to eating U.S. rice. The Federation says the nutritional benefits far outweigh any perceived risk from arsenic. Toxicologist Dr. Jim Coughlin says that arsenic is a famous poison and alarms people and gets a lot of attention. Coughlin has been working with the rice industry. He says the levels are very low. The USA Rice Federation says that it agrees with the Food and Drug Administration that any standard set for arsenic in rice should be the result of a carefully conducted risk assessment. If you come from the generation that was not raised using computers, you might find social media technology too overwhelming to use. Well, if you're one of those, you're not alone. And recently, Mississippi 4-H'ers schooled Holly Springs area community leaders in the basics of using social media. The 4-H'ers taught them how social media can benefit organizations, businesses, and charities. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from the Marshall County Office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Those who attended the 4-H social media training for community leaders were pleasantly surprised. Using technology isn't so scary after all when you have good instruction. State Representative Kelvin Buck says he now sees a great need for social media. Listen, I've always been afraid of the social media. I've always been reluctant to get involved with things like Facebook and tweeting. In an area like this, rural Mississippi, having a way to communicate when we don't really have a television station uh, or any kind of a other social media, our newspaper only comes out once a week, it's very uh, hard and difficult to get information out. Uh, to me, this uh, opportunity to learn how to use this social media 
uh, by way of the computer systems uh, will give us a, a whole new world. For example, Buck says the technology will be instrumental in promoting the Alliance Charitable Foundation dedicated to public health. 4-H'ers taught participants step-by-step step how to use sites like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and blogs. Senior 4-H'er Marissa Landon shares some of her best advice for beginners. Start with a Facebook page and then you should go to a blog. Blogs are a really big thing to have and they're starting to get bigger. You should make posts um, at least once a week. Um, and it really doesn't, it can be things about your business, but also other people can post on your blog. And they don't have to be very long either. They can be something short, sweet, straight to the point, and something that people would be interested in knowing. It's very, very, very smart to add captions with your pictures. That is a very important thing because most people might not know that, um, what's your purpose behind your picture. A picture's worth a thousand words, and that's, that's a big thing. Additionally, Landon says the biggest benefit of social media is that it's like free advertising and you can promote any type of interest you want. From Holly Springs, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. What is probably the most popular flowering tree in Mississippi? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us the beauty that crepe myrtles bring to our landscapes. If there's one plant that could be called the flower of the south, it has to be the crepe myrtle. Colorful flowers put on a show from early summer through late fall. Here at the MSU South Mississippi Branch Station in Poplarville, crepe myrtles have been grown and evaluated for over 25 years. The spectacular flowers are actually large panicles composed of many small flowers. These panicles can be more than eight inches long. Flower colors range from white, shades of pink and purple, and rich reds. The small flowers have a crinkled edge resembling crepe paper, hence the name. Crepe myrtles have other outstanding qualities. As the trees mature, the bark begins to peel or exfoliate, revealing the inner bark colors, ranging from gray-green to dark cinnamon red. The solid green summer foliage transitions to a bright red-orange in the fall. There is a new crepe myrtle called Delta Jazz that I'm really excited about, and it was developed at Mississippi State. Delta Jazz has unusual foliage, emerging rich raspberry maroon, and then maturing to a dark mahogany brown. This foliage color accents the clusters of medium pink flowers in the late summer. Delta Jazz makes a fantastic landscape feature plant. If you would like more information about crepe myrtles, please request the extension publication, Crate Myrtle, Flower of the South, from your county extension office or msucares.com. Crate Myrtles are a landscape favorite throughout the South because of showy flowers and interesting bark. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Now Gary says that crepe myrtles are considered hardy in climate zone seven to nine and that there's one variety that will grow in zone six. In the feature segment today, most young people would like to produce a viral video seen by millions on YouTube. Well, three brothers who live on a Kansas farm did that, and it's been watched more than seven million times. Well, it's time now with Marcus with Leighton and Leighton. Uh, some important monthly reports for the beef sector this week. That's right. The cattle on feed and coal storage numbers all came out on Friday the 21st. Also ahead in this segment, a forecast of tighter hog supplies and higher prices by 2013. A negative report on rice is disputed, and analysts wonder if the corn market is losing steam. We begin with the cattle sector, where new on-feed numbers and coal storage numbers were released Friday afternoon. Brugler Marketing reported in advance that the trade seemed to be anticipating that August placements would be down about 6% year over year. Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley answered questions about the cattle business in this report. So the market pretty much was expecting lower placements in this new on-feed report. That's the census. Uh, and again, it's the second month in a row that we've been expecting lower placements. Although, I will say, you know, going back further months, there's always been this expectation that placements will be low because of the tight supply situation that we've been in for really a number of years, been exacerbated by the drought. But those really never came to fruition until last month, and then that, that's expected to continue into this, this month's cattle on-feed report. What has the price picture been of late the last week or so as far as uh, cattle? 
Cattle prices have been improving, uh, largely due to uh, the fact that we got some rain out of Isaac that, that really helped, didn't help corn, but it didn't continue to hurt it. So corn prices have been suppressed a little bit over the past couple of uh, days, maybe even a, as much as a week, week and a half. So that's really helped bolster uh, live cattle prices. And that's also, especially feeder cattle prices due to the fact that they, they primarily eat corn once they get in the feedlot. So uh, for the most part, prices have been improving. We've seen you know some help from, from outside markets has, has helped uh, bring about some picture of improved demand, but all of that still is pretty sketchy, but still prices have been improving. And you mentioned rain from Isaac uh, as, we, as we head towards fall and winter, uh, pasture, pasture development, uh, how's that looking? Uh, in Mississippi, it looks really good. Outside of Mississippi and outside of some other sm small se section of states, it looks, still looks really poor. Uh, wheat pasture cattle could be a question mark, you know, demand for those types of cattle because uh, the wheat belt is still pretty dry. They'll still obviously try to get a crop in, but how good the good stand they get is, is the, the question mark as we move into the, the, the summer. Mm -hmm. So overall, longer term here, uh, kind of optimistic as far as the market? You can't help but be a little bit because it is, supplies are so tight. We're expecting to see that in this month's feed report and continuing into the fall. So uh, the, the tight supply should help keep prices at least steady, maybe even higher. Switching to pork now, hog producers in the United States have been selling their animals quickly in order to limit how much they'll have to spend on feed later this year. This is reflected in a report from Reuters, one that says hog slaughter reached a record high in August. Many farmers are losing money though on the deal, but they think there could be steeper losses if they wait even longer. Now a forecast for 2013 does indicate higher prices for producers as pork supplies tighten up some. Let's move to our trivia quiz for this week. Here is the question. Take a look at it. Where is the largest blackberry farm in the world located? Is it Singapore or Arkansas or in the Napa Valley or in Louisiana? You'll find out the answer in a few more minutes. Well, we're going to pause for a short break on farm wheat. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the second part of the markets. Leighton Span reports that the corn market seems to be losing steam, and he updates us on the wheat market. In the feature segment today, everyone wants their 15 minutes of fame, where three Kansas brothers made a video on their farm, and it went viral with more than 7 million views. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Now, before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. The Crosby Arbore Arboretum will host its native plant sale on Friday and Saturday, September 28th and 29th. The Arboretum is located at Picayune. The sale will run from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Arboretum members get in one hour early. Experts will be on hand to help you select plants suited to your landscape. The Fall Flower and Garden Fest is Friday and Saturday, October 5th and 6th. It takes place at the Truck Crops Branch Experiment Station at Crystal Springs. Hours are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. both days. Admission is free and there will be commercial vendors on hand selling plants. You will see hundreds of varieties of vegetables and ornamental plants actually growing on site. The Gulf South Blueberry Growers Association will hold its annual field day on Thursday, October 11th. The location is the Giles Blueberry Farm near Waynesboro, Mississippi. We'll have links on the Farm Week website. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week snapshot. Consumer Reports Magazine, as you heard earlier, chose this week, the week of the Delta Rice Luncheon and National Rice Month, to take a swipe at rice. The publication said tests show inorganic arsenic in a wide range of rice products and advised consumers cut back on consumption. Well, the USA Rice Federation called the report incomplete and inaccurate on many levels. The trade group said consumers need to know arsenic is a naturally occurring element in our air, water, rocks, and soil. 
Analysts say that the corn trade has been unable to attract a lot of new speculative money in the last couple of weeks. This development and this week's roller coaster type market has some folks thinking a downtrend in price is in the making. Analyst Elaine Cub says it does seem that corn may be running out of steam. If you look at it from a fundamental standpoint, from the harvest reports, most of the worst fields in the U.S. Corn Belt have already been harvested. So the worst news, the most bullish news from a harvest yield standpoint has probably already been considered and thought about by the market. On Thursday in the wheat pit, the trade was anticipating a modest bounce in prices after some recent declines. Analysts like Naomi Bloom note that technically wheat is still moving sideways. She says there is support in this market from the renewed concerns about what will happen with rural wheat supplies. If you look at a chart right now, wheat has just been walking on the sideways plank between um, 875 as support and 925 as resistance on the December chart. It's likely to continue to do that. The biggest thing in wheat right now still is with Russia. We've been talking about them for weeks. Will they or won't they stop the export? And the biggest thing is that with Russia, you can't count on what they're going to say. You just have to watch what they're going to do. The difference now right now is that the USDA pegs Russian production at 43 million metric tons. And actually, most of the trade industry in Russia this week has come out and said, no, it's probably more like 38 to 40 million metric tons. And in 2010, when they actually did implement the export restrictions, they had their production at 41.5 million metric tons. So we are below that. Just ahead of a feature story, here's that trivia answer for you. Again, our topic was wheat, and the correct choice is B, Arkansas. Well, U.S. agriculture often struggles to get its message and point of view before the public. It seems that the best-crafted campaigns don't have the effect they wish. Well, in the feature segment, you'll meet three Kansas brothers who put together a music video about their family farm. It's been viewed more than seven million times on YouTube. How did it happen? Mark DeMarket's Paul Yeager reports. The Kansas prairie is well known for its fields of wheat, soybeans, and irrigation rigs. Tucked into the central part of the Sunflower State near Assyria is a farmstead known around the world. Well, the World Wide Web, that is. What began as a tribute to the beauty of the Kansas landscape quickly escalates into a rat parody as performed by the Peterson brothers, college senior Greg, college freshman Nathan, and high school junior Kendall. I was at a Sonic and I was with my friends and the song comes on the radio and I'm like, oh hey, it's a stupid song again. And I'm like, I'm gonna change the words, make my friends laugh. And so I uh, changed the words and my friends thought it was funny. And so I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe I'll make a music video out of that. When I step to the bunk, yeah, this is what I see. Uh -huh. All the hungry cattle are staring at me. I got passion that springtime idea, inspired by LMFAO's Sexy and I Know It, became the summer sensation, I'm farming and I grow it. I'm farming and I grow it. I love being out here in the open. I think there's no better place to live than out here in, in the country. I love it. Greg started scripting and scouting locations for his music video. Realizing he was going to need some help, he enlisted the assistance of his two brothers to co-star in the project, albeit reluctantly at first. It took a little more motivation to actually film it and stuff because we'd film like after work when we were done and you know we'd be tired and so me and Kendall he'd have to do a little more convincing but you know once we got going it was a lot of fun. Crew calls for the aspiring filmmaker sometimes came before sunrise to maximize good light opportunities and workday commitments. The boy's sister Laura also played a vital role running the camera on some of the more memorable shots. I tell Laura, okay, you know, make sure we're in the shot, or, you know, okay, I want you to pan from left to right. She was kind of my, so I could be two places at once, and then we just acted out, and we'd take two or three shots to make sure we had a good one, and it took three weeks. Greg Peterson says the goal was to educate others about what he and his family do on their farm. We are hoping we'd, our, our, we'd make it good enough that our Facebook friends would want to watch it. You know, I've got 
I've got friends from the, from the city who don't know anything about farming. This is how I roll. Without me, the world be out of control. The, hours the video was posted on Facebook and Twitter, and seemingly overnight, it went viral. By late in the summer, the video had been watched nearly 7 million times. It's been pretty crazy. Just kind of weird that, uh, that they know us because we feel like normal people still and we try to act like normal people still. The way everyone's connected and I think it's important for agriculture to be part of that because we're uh, really a main part of social life and just life everywhere um, and people need to know about it. I'm farming and I grow it. Local news outlets helped spread the story. That led to an appearance on Fox News which flew the entire family to New York City. New York. Like Dorothy, the boys realized they weren't in Kansas anymore when they visited Times Square. It's not like we're just in the middle of Kansas anymore doing, doing our daily stuff. It's almost a little bit bigger and different. So. When we were in New York for that interview, uh, we had one guy while we were out touring, and he said, hey, aren't Aren't you guys the ones that are on Fox News this morning? And that was when we were really uh, just kind of blown away. And that was the only time in New York that someone recognized us, which was OK with us. There's nothing quite like the days leading up to a wheat harvest in central Kansas. The Farming and I Grow It video was not the boys' first attempt at educating others about agriculture. Previous videos showcased the family in various farming activity. But it was the use of social media that took these rural landscapes and exposed them to viewers all over the world. There is a huge misconception among the American consumer about what goes on in agriculture. Uh, people don't understand where their food comes from, they don't understand how their food is produced. And videos such as what the Peterson brothers have done do an excellent job of giving the American public just a glimpse just a small look into the life of a farmer, in this case a Kansas grain farmer and livestock producer. And they've done a wonderful job of, of exposing themselves to the world and their operation to the world. Greg, a student at Kansas State University, is majoring in agricultural communications. He's not sure what he was going to do with that degree, but he may help others now learn how to make a viral video. I think we're as normal as, as anybody else is and we're just doing our best like everyone else is. Greg is interested in music. He's already created his own YouTube channel with his creations. I worked on that for years, trying to build an audience, you know, and I, and I built, you know, one. I've got ideas. I've got a whole list of ideas. I, that never runs out. It's just you have to take time to, to do them. And for a time this summer, handling media requests was getting in the way of the basics, like farming. But the Peterson parents are understanding and at the same time taking note of all the attention given to their family. We need to keep, keep bringing out good stories rather than people seeing the, you know, the negative parts of agriculture. And we need to keep promoting all the good and um, just how hard farmers work to feed the world and all of the good we're doing. And as they grow it and we eat it, the world learns more about rural America. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yates. I'm farming and I grow it. And if you'd like to watch this story on the Peterson Brothers again and their viral video, go to our FarmWeek website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch FarmWeek stories on YouTube and Facebook. We'll also have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well as read the script. Now, there will also be a link to where you can watch the Peterson video itself in its entirety. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Now, Leighton, one of the things, you know, viral video, some of you are watching and say, well, what's a viral video? Well, that's a video on YouTube or on the web that it spreads like a virus. So that's hence the viral part. And in this case, somehow, when this story was first done, it was less than 7 million. Well, now it's mm -hmm. more than 7 million as far as the views that it's received. And once again, the trick is, is what makes a video go viral? And people are still trying to figure that out. But, um, but the important thing, especially think, if you're not naked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but using this new technology, uh, this younger generation that really doesn't know anything about farming or farm life is uh, it's gotten exposed a whole lot. to it as yeah. well. There's another farm family in, uh, I think it's New York State. They're on a dairy farm, 
and the, the uh, boys called Little Fred, and they have a video that's gone viral. Not as many views, but I think still over a million, which, hey, we would love a million on a Farm Week <laughs> <laughs> video on YouTube. So uh, once again, uh, hey, any way we can get the word out, uh, we, we will take the help. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, you won't confuse these fish with farm-raised catfish. You've probably already seen pictures of them jumping out of the water, causing mayhem as they crash into boats. The Asian carp is spreading in the Mississippi River and it's threatening the Great Lakes. Is there a commercial market for this fish? In southern gardening, repetition, it's more than planting the same plant and it can make your landscape look great. Now, if you'd like further information on a Farm Week story, you can suggest a story to us. You need to get in touch with us. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Our snail mail address, if you'd like that, is Farm Week, Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. Our telephone number is 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your county office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. For the rest of Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.